Welcome everybody, I'm Katie Irizarry, you're here today with The Pit, and we're bringing you a very special interview with both Lizzie Hale and Joe Hottinger of Hailstorm. Today they are talking about the official vinyl release of the 10th anniversary of Hailstorm's live in Philly performance. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having yeah. us, this is awesome. <laughs> so this is actually the first time ever that this vinyl is being released. It had only been released previously, I'm assuming just on CD format. It was voted on by fans via Run Out Groove. Had this not been voted on and not a part of this Run Out Groove campaign, do you think that you would have eventually had plans to release this on vinyl? I, I think so. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think uh, especially considering... I, it was like so many lifetimes ago and um, we we on a personal level just have fun looking back on those times so much and, and to be able to share that with people that um, that maybe 10 years ago weren't there and weren't aware of that uh, is pretty special. Yeah, to us. We're big vinyl collectors, yeah. so anything we can put out, we'll put out, we'll try to put out on vinyl anyway, you know, so might as well. It's there. It exists. So yeah make it vinyl no reason not to <laughs> was there ever a video component that was filmed with this as well or was this always exclusively audio no there's a, there's yeah, a there's dvd a, there's a dvd that that went with it and uh, which is even more of a mind trip because uh you know you get that you get the the visual aspect of where we, we were at in our heads and um, and with our haircuts. And with our haircuts, yeah. <laughs> I'm about the same <laughs> or, now. Or the choices of of, uh, of clothing, which yeah. you know that that year was a, a a dark time for me. I don't really don't know what I was going for. <laughs> I can't believe like how like that my head is still attached to my body. How hard I used to go. <laughs> oh, I, oh yeah, with the head banging and yeah. everything. Yeah. I was watching. I was like, oh my god, that looks so painful. <laughs> I, think, I think we just showed our age, but with that statement. Yeah. <laughs> From years of performing and being on the stage and and just being out there and being so physical, do you happen to have any um, ailments now that are maybe directly related, whether it be some neck pain or maybe from playing guitar, some wrist pain? It's probably a, some liver damage. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know about that definitely. yet. We're definitely, uh, you know, a few brain cells short, yeah. shorter than we used to be. But um, I, no, not really. I, the I, for for me personally, um, just over the years, it's been more of a. I, I do a lot of uh, like prevention practices for all of those things. You know, whether it be for my voice or you know hearing, we've always been really good at protecting our ears. And the only thing, the weird thing now, and this comes from me wearing high heels, is that I've been wearing high heels on stage for so long um, that I can't work my my wah pedal on my on my uh, pedal board without. I mean, I can without it, but I don't have the dexterity. And now, unless, now during yeah. COVID times, you haven't really. I know. Uh, I need to start. We I need to start wearing the eight-inch heels around you're, the house or something. You're you're screwed. <laughs> Doing the dishes, wearing high heels. People do that, right? Yeah. Get back into practice. I mean, I'm dressed up just to sit in my living room and talk to you guys. I don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I I actually read that you, Lizzie, had previously stated that right before you took the stage at this particular performance, which was at the Theater of the Living Arts right here in Philadelphia, where I am actually right now, and um, you said that you felt a little bit of panic. Do you still feel that 10 years later before you take the stage at a gig? It's not necessarily a, um, a matter of getting rid of that or calming myself down. It's just something that's always been there. And maybe when I was a, a young teenager, it was... A little bit more overwhelming but it is still this like and um and i i and i say panic in such a positive way because it's and something different will always trigger it whether somebody says hey we only have 10 minutes till showtime and then all of a sudden it'll be like oh you know just like yeah. this like electricity and all of a sudden your your mindset just 
changes and it's almost like you just become like sharpened you know and okay this is the, it's happening the task at hand is happening it's like real and um and so yeah i think i think it was maybe more overwhelming back in the day but it still happens every single night and i feel like if it doesn't if that ever goes away like i gotta like you know quit or something because it is such an amazing tool so like uh we don't use any click tracks or any backing tracks there's no lip syncing um and we actually like have jam sessions live in front of people where we don't really know how we're going to end the song and so that's a whole different element because when you're walking on stage you're depending on each other and you're depending on yourself and things could go amazing and be this amazing moment that you'll never forget or they can go horribly wrong but that's up to you and that's the beauty of live music so that's more of the the feeling that i, get. I remember when i had my first band in high school and it was <laughs> my singer Paul he would get really nervous like that you know before a show and I was just I didn't realize how nervous he actually was I thought he was kind of joking so I'd be like come on Paul there's only five minutes left buddy five He's minutes an all right, no, all right. now four minutes and 30 seconds Paul I'd be like there, you know and he was like stop it stop and then he I, I kept the timer going till he just threw up <laughs> and I was like oh sorry buddy wow you're you're a good friend <laughs> and, and you wonder why you aren't still in a band together with him. <laughs> right. You've never done that to me. No, I learned my lesson. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> so, Paul, wherever you are, who is, I think, actually, Paul is still in Philly, isn't yeah, he? he's in Philly. Yeah. Uh, well, Paul, if you're listening, uh, thank you so much for your service and, <laughs> and, and ridding him of that habit. <laughs> I would love to take everyone back to that night at the TLA in 2010, the mindset of each of you at that time, what your hopes were, what your dreams are, and what's been accomplished between then and now that either you had hoped for that's finally come to fruition or that you never in your wildest dreams could even have imagined that actually has happened between now and then. Oh, wow. Well, working backwards, practically everything. Um, we had no idea. Like when we were getting ready to go on stage, uh, you know, there was like, all of our friends were there. Our family was there. Um, uh, that that was like a dream come true gig for me. That was where I saw my yeah. first ever show was the TLA. Oh yeah. Back in, what band is it? It was the Verve Pipe, Tonic, and K's Choice. So Super nice. 90s. <laughs> and uh, and it was awesome. It was like my, you know it was my first show and you're just looking at everything. Like I was already way into rock and roll and playing guitar, but I'd never you know been to a show and. You see, like, them changing gear out on stage. I had no idea what was going on. There's the board with all the knobs. I was like, oh, my God. Like, how does this work? <laughs> this is insane. What does that do? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, the, the pure magic of just having no idea and yeah. wanting to do it so bad. And so it was cool. It was neat. To, I was like, cool. We're back to TLA. Back to and also, we had just released our first record. So, and, and a lot of the songs that we played... At, at the TLA, we were playing like live for the first time. We hadn't really done a whole lot of that. And, uh, and I remember being, it was just such a weird step because there was a lot of people that like knew us before we got signed and knew like us as a local band that were there. And there's a lot of people that were there that, that helped get us to that point. You know, yeah, we used to play once a week back in the day at Abilene's on South street, across the street from TLA yeah. every Tuesday night. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> there was a lot of trouble that went down. Yeah, um, with all with all those bands, but yeah, so it was kind of weird. It was like almost like a like a graduation, you know, where it's like we've we've made it out of the small pond into this big sea, and we have no idea what's going to happen. But hey, guys, we're doing it. We're really doing it on this whole other level. And um, so yeah, I and and from then to now, I mean we could have never imagined i mean we've we've toured the world we've headlined touring the world we've we've won a grammy we you know we uh, uh we we've met so many different people and different friends and had so many different adventures and learned so much about ourselves even just outside of the band whilst doing this so yeah i i don't think we had any clue no, you. I mean, you can't. I, I would always people like, oh man, you're you're gonna do it. You're gonna make. You know, like I don't know, man. We'll see. You yeah, know, we're just gonna do what we always do and just play rock well, shows. <laughs> because we we're, see what happens. We always had this realistic aspect, even when we were you know teenagers, just kind of coming up in the local scene. Whereas you know nobody really knows. Like we we know incredible bands, like incredibly talented people that never even made it past their first record on a major on a major label so it, it you know it's there's a difference between 
believing that you are capable of great things. And then all of a sudden, you know, fate and opportunity meet somewhere and those things actually happen. So like, well, and, and we've worked hard too, but we're, we're lucky to be in the position we're at now. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you'd mentioned you won a grant. You won two Grammys, if I'm not mistaken, one in 2013 and, and last year, or was that just a... We were nominated for two. Nominated last year, yes. It was appropriate. We we uh we went uh, to the Grammys, and um, I ended up presenting for the pre-tell for uh, for a couple categories, and the, our category comes up, and we're all sitting there. We're sitting there with uh with the so, Alice in Chains boys, who yeah. <laughs> they're just like, well, you know, we've never won a Grammy, so. <laughs> and then of course, and then of course, Chris Cornell ended up getting it, and and his kids went and up his and kids went up it. and it accepted sweet. it. It was beautiful. Everybody cried, and uh, we all stood up with the Alice in Chains guys. We're like, all right, let's go to the bar. And <laughs> what did Jerry say? Like eleven time loser. He's like, yeah, I'm out of here. Keeping the streak alive. Yeah, eleven keep... times we've been nominated, and eleven times we've lost. You <laughs> know, like, yeah, buddy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, every, in, everybody was in good spirits about it. But, uh, but yeah, nominated for two and got one in uh, 2012. That's awesome. And like, what does that mean to you? Like, when when you got that Grammy, I mean, that was only two years after this performance, after your first album had come out. Like, what did that mean to you? What went through your head just to see that you were nominated, let alone that you actually won this prestigious accolade? Uh, that was crazy. Like, we were on stage in Madison at the, the whatever theater there. Uh, when, like, we have a part in the show usually where we all walk off and Lizzie stays and does a piano thing, you know, and talks to the crowd a bit. And I walked off my guitar tech, Justin was like, hey, buddy, you know, you guys got nominated for a Grammy. I was like, shut up. No I didn't believe him. Like, I got my phone and Googled. I was like, oh, my gosh, shit, we actually were. Like, I didn't, we didn't even know they knew who yeah, we were. Yeah, like, how did they even? How, why, who told we, them? Yeah, who told them about us? You know? but, uh, <laughs> but I ran out. Lizzie hadn't started the song yet. She, you know, she's a little long-winded. And... Uh, <laughs> As you can tell. <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, Lizzie, we got nominated for a Grammy. And it was super cool. Some girl in the crowd took a picture kind of at that moment when, like, she understood what I was telling her. And it's such a cool picture of Lizzie just, like, you know, she's got <laughs> the wide-eyed, like, oh, my God thing. And it was neat. You, the crowd was like, what? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, because, like, everybody... <laughs> I, I it, like everybody like in the front row was like was like is is everybody okay like it must have looked like you know my face must have looked like somebody died or something <laughs> and uh, and I just turned to the crowd and I'm just like I was just told that we got nominated for a Grammy and like the place just went nuts it was like you know yeah, their fun. favorite team scored a touchdown but then like the rest of the night because we hadn't finished the set yet we were just like. I don't remember, no, you know, the we rest were, of that performance. We were just we like, were what, what does it mean? What's going on? Anyway, we went and we had no... We knew we weren't going to win. Yeah, we're like, no. it was like Lamb of God and... It, it was Lamb of God, Anthrax, Anthrax Marilyn Manson... Um, Maybe Megadeth, and I Megadeth. don't know. Yeah. And yeah. so we're like, dude, we're not... We are like such a weird oddball in this entire category well we get to go you know to the party so that, yeah it was yeah, like, yeah we got to get be in. great <laughs> we, were so, we were so awkward at most of them we're just like i don't oh, know are we cool you know <laughs> there's sting over there there's katie perry hi uh, i'm not saying hi we did say hi to quincy jones I, I said hi to katie perry but that was because i had two glasses of wine and felt confident <laughs> she was talking to d devon i'm like she'll never remember this and but like I'll, i've got it neither will i so, <laughs> so I, I said something I, I i think i put on like my 17 year old you know like aggressive like personality yeah. when i went back in the day you know it's like and just like hey uh hi i'm lizzie hale from the band hailstorm and uh we just won our first grammy uh tonight and i just wanted to come over and say hi to you just like something really like like there was no purpose <laughs> and, cool. she, and she was like she was like all right well this is dita von Teese. i'm like oh hi and then i'm like all right i'll see you later this is it so i gotta go i gotta go <laughs> too awkward when we won so we were sitting there and we're like our category comes up and and instead of saying hailstorm um the presenter said love bites so we we all heard like the l you know and we're like oh lamb of god got it like for that split second we're like oh no wait it's us and like we went up there and like had nothing prepared and you know that was one time that i couldn't rj speak. was prepared rj yeah he's R always ready to win an award <laughs> I, rj had been with i he had been waiting to like this is my moment my moment and um but yeah no it was it was cool it was cool and we just couldn't believe it like we called our dads and our dads cried and it was it was cool. It was neat. Yeah, it, was I, it, it was just a, for me for us. It was just such a personal accomplishment with you know us in the band and 
I, I think it was my little bro that was like, we're crazy for starting a band, but we weren't stupid. This was not a stupid idea. You know, you, you always think about like the handful of people that were trying to steer you away from it. And, you know, I, for me personally, when I was in middle school, I would get interventions by, by my middle school teachers, like after class, because all I could talk about was this band and uh, being in a band. And they were very against that because, you know, obviously everything else came second after that. So they had a good reason because I went from being like an honor roll student to just be like, C is fine. C's are fine. <laughs> Um, I, you know, so remember kids, don't try too hard. Don't try too hard. No. <laughs> yeah. This is bad message. But, um, but yeah. So you think about those things too. It's like, you know what? Like we did the right thing. And, um, so yeah, I don't know. It's cool. You can fill it with like three shots of liquor. It holds liquor. three shots. It holds three shots. Yeah. Just for <laughs> so anybody, a little trivia so there. If you drink one Grammy of tequila. You're, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be well on your way yeah. to, Trouble. not remembering where the, <laughs> what happened that night. I love that you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had to try it. <laughs> Amazing. I have to say, by the way, there was like this inner fangirl of me that just like died knowing that Lizzie Hale, Dita Von Teese, and Katy Perry were hanging out together. Like that <laughs> is crazy. And that kind of brings me to something else. Like you have performed with, shared the stage with, and even collaborated with some massive names. I mean, everyone from Stone Sour and Shine Down. So even people who aren't really necessarily in this world, like Lindsey Sterling and Machine Gun Kelly, who would you say was probably some of the, your favorites to collaborate with? And who are some people that maybe you haven't performed with or collaborated with that you would like to in the future? I've been so lucky. Um, I've shared the stage with most of my idols, the people that, that you know, taught me that weird was okay. And, and, you know, the reason I am, you know, a, a rock star is because of these people. So it's, I've gotten to share the stage with Alice Cooper and Tom Kiefer. And, and I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's been such an amazing journey. And I love saying yes to adventure. And, um, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff in the country world to, uh, Corey Marks. Uh, I, we just released a duet, um, called Out in the Rain. And I like that. I like, when you would sing with Eric Church. Yeah, well, like, that's, I was, that was getting to that because awesome. it's like, because Eric <laughs> is such a rock star in his country world. He was going to perform on, you know, the on the CMAs, right? I get this email out of the blue from, from our management saying like, yeah, um, so Eric Church wants to have you come up and sing with him on, on the CMAs because I guess... His label wants him to do his new single, but he doesn't want to do that. He wanted to do a song that he had called That's Damn Rock and Roll, but he wanted to have a rock and roll person up there to represent. So I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do this, right? And it just became this whole amazing thing. Like we did the performance and then he took us out on tour with him. So we were opening up the show, just opening up this massive country show, you know, um, <laughs> as a rock band and and he would come up to us and he's like all right so like you're here for a reason i don't want any ballads i don't want you catering to the country audience you are here to blow off some you know <laughs> blow some cowboy hats off you know and so we did um but yeah that was one of my favorites to perform because uh you know obviously on national television and then we had our rehearsals and so i had my parts he had his and then right before we went on he was about to get like into this like elevator thing to be like launched onto the stage you know just risen up on the stage and uh and he's like lizzie lizzie i had an idea so you know there's gonna be a certain point like like midway through the song where i'm just gonna kind of like step back and you just do something cool just do something <laughs> cool and i'm like be cool. what what no no what he's like no it's gonna be great it's gonna be great so it's like he like forced me to like improv during that thing and and uh, to this day, I still like, I look, I look at that performance and I'm like, oh yeah, Lizzie's not home. Lizzie blacked out. Somebody else took over, you know, <laughs> like that's a, that, but that was what, like, there's been a few moments when I watch you collaborate with people on say, like I'll go out in the crowd, you know, and when you s sang with Slash in Amsterdam, oh yeah, uh, you did a Guns N' Roses song and uh, you, you go out there and when she like hits one of her moments with her voice, it's so magical, like there's literally like a wave of energy from the speakers to the back of the arena. Like, cause you feel it, you get like the tingly thing, you know, and something awesome <laughs> happens. And I remember in that the arena at the award show, like 
like she went off in that bridge and the whole plate like whew, you just felt it and then i like look back and you could see it like ride up to the back of the room and it was it, you know that's that's the magic that's the Thank good you, stuff Jared. no it's cool though it's like <laughs> he's so nice i wish i could uh, watch you sing more often i know right yeah yeah one of these days i'm over there just like don't fuck up oh yeah don't yeah you up. never you don't pay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what no anyway that's okay that's okay uh, uh our bass player Josh and I were just like we some there was a, been a couple times on stage where where like Joe's rig will go down and so we have to just kind of be this power trio for the rest of the song and we're like we pulled it off so yeah just take a break it's fine all yeah, right just just go ahead and say but <laughs> um, but uh, and for the second part of your question um, I still would love to do something with heart with uh, you know, with Ann Wilson and Nancy and Foo Fighters would be great and uh, you Metallica, Metallica would be great yeah, yeah that like yeah just yeah let me know i'm here i'm here to serve <laughs> how have you not done that with those bands i mean really i, I feel like that time is coming it's coming because I, I i can absolutely picture you on stage with all three of the bands that you just mentioned <laughs> nice see we're putting it out in the universe earlier this year let's talk a little bit about you guys had released an ep called reimagined and you basically took five previous hailstorm songs and kind of redid them as well as a couple of cover songs um, can you tell me why, what was the idea behind that? Why did you choose those particular songs to, and why did you choose to kind of remaster them and, and redo them? In between album cycles, we've gotten into this habit of of putting out cover EPs. So we've had, you know, um, Reanimate was that series. And this time around, we just wanted to shake it up, you know, and we, and we do that all the time, man. As soon as something like starts to become a little like boring or uninteresting you know for for us personally we we have to do something different so um so we ended up I, we did commit to one cover we put one cover on it um we did we didn't we went for the diva stuff and uh did um i will always love you um in in a weird hybrid style of both the whitney version and the dolly version but with a little bit of heart thrown in we ended up picking a bunch of songs we yeah we had a bunch and then we started kind of hashing through it in the studio and you know you you just go down the path of least resistance we're like oh no we know exactly what to do on this one and kind of came up with a few different vibes but then there was some we had to yeah, fight for yeah some, something wasn't working we're like uh well, let's just try this other one you know whatever you just do what feels good and get you excited and follow that path yeah always totally i mean you guys guys did great i'm here for it absolutely i mean that particular cover of I Will Always Love You was just, I mean, your voice is incredible. Are you a classically trained singer? Have you had lessons or did you just kind of just sing on your own and, and that voice just came out of you like a Ronnie James Dio? <laughs> um, it was a little hybrid of both because when we started the band, I was 13 and uh, for the first three years, I was just, I didn't even know what a warm up was or any of that. And um, I ended up when I was 16, we got the opportunity to open up for uh, for the lead singer of Kicks <laughs> from back in the 80s. And uh, he had a side project called Funny Money and we got to open up for him. And he was like humming and singing into a towel in, in the dressing room. And, you know, me being the awkward kid that I was and not understanding that was. i probably should yeah sorry still am um but i, pro I probably shouldn't have interrupted him but but i was like what are you doing <laughs> you know and uh and he's like oh i'm warming up i'm like oh okay like are, is everybody supposed to do that kind of thing i'm just very naive about it and uh and he's like well i actually give lessons in the basement of marty's music store in harrisburg i'm like i go into marty's all the time you've been in the basement the whole time like yeah they stuck me in the basement so this guy said yeah. to come to the basement of this music store and you went and i went yeah i know <laughs> you didn't get murdered um, he's like <laughs> yeah and uh no he's a, a super super sweet guy um but uh yeah so i went down for a lesson and, and like he, he, I ended up going to him like every Tuesday uh, for the next like two and a half years and he taught me everything that he knows and um, and I still use those practices today. So um, a lot of it was like basic like common sense like you have to stay hydrated, um, warm up to some degree um, every day. It, you don't have to be in a set routine because every day is going to be different. So if I wake up and I'm like, la, okay, everything's there. I like just do a little bit to kind of like 
get it going and warmed up um, and then do some kind of a cool down. And yeah, and it's a lot of it is just don't be stupid and stay out till 4 a.m. talking and drinking in bars. That's not, <laughs> it's not That's good. That's why for I'm touring. glad I play guitar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's so, so um, I'm very, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, to have met him early on. Um, I don't think that I would have the voice that I have today because he gave me the tools. I didn't have any, you know, real lessons after that. I've, I've, I've tried to like go in with certain people, but I don't, I don't trust a whole lot of, of them. You know, like, it, like there'd be some person who's like, oh, I have a DVD out about like teaching people how to scream. And I'm like, okay. And then I would go and, you know, maybe use some of it. And like, it would start to like, it felt like I was straining something. I'm like, okay, that's not for me. So I just keep it to myself. And now I've just kind of been my own trainer. Um, for Are you ever going to put out a DVD? How to sing like me? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that I would give people some advice, but I don't know about putting out a DVD. <laughs> I, I feel like I thought about that, but then I'm like, that's just so weird. And you could have a section on like how to tambourine and sing at the same time. Oh yeah. You just got to keep the rhythm going. <laughs> Is that something that you're concerned about? <laughs> yeah, I'm worried that maybe you're not going to be able to keep up your tambo skills. Yeah, I don't really have song. any tambo skills. <laughs> I don't do that. All right. All right. <laughs> so I did back in the day. Uh, the last time I played a tambourine was at like a bowling alley gig when I was like 14. See? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll find out if you use it, if you lose it, you know, or don't use it if you lose it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to test this theory. <laughs> One of my favorite things that you ever did, and I think that really made me connect with you on more of a personal fan for Lizzie Hale versus just being a Hailstorm fan level was you used to do an advice column with Revolver Magazine. Oh, yeah. And uh, you now, if I'm not mistaken, kind of do something similar on your Snapchat or I know you were for a time. Um, what kind of inspires you to do that? What's the motivation behind that? And do you maybe have any plans to take that to the next level? Maybe write a, a book or, or something that kind of helps guide people or, or give advice? Because I think you're, you have very, have, uh, very much have a talent for that. Oh, thank you. Um, I, just, I just like people. I, you know, and I, I've just, I've always been that way and if i can help in any capacity i want to um just genuinely and, and not even for anybody else or like i'm trying to do good in the world it's just it's for me it makes me feel good and you know like you give somebody a a, a guitar pick and it's just a piece of plastic you know it doesn't it means it, it it means nothing on my end but i know that if i give that to that little girl in the front row she's gonna light up and it's just gonna make my day so um if you're in a uh position where people are listening to you, um, for better or worse, um, choose to put out that positivity and choose to promote that, uh, the connectivity to each other and, you know, staying, you know, uh, we're all in this together, that kind of thematic stuff. It's funny because af after this interview, I actually have a, a, a meeting um, with a uh, with a publisher because they're talking about maybe doing something like that. So they they it's it's on there and they approached me. So I'm just like, well, uh, we're gonna have the meeting and see if it works. And if it does, then m you might see that in the near future. So, well, put me on the list for an advanced copy because I would love to read that. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say, you know, I think you are such a role model to women, to young girls. And just to anyone, really. And so I'm so glad to see you doing this kind of stuff. What does that word role model mean to you? Is that something you feel a lot of pressure to kind of to be? Or, or do you kind of feel like maybe an honor? Like, what does that mean to you to be considered a role model? It's, it's really humbling because, you know, you, you, don't, you don't think about that, you know, when you, when you start in on one of these things and, and you start your band and you just want to rock and you don't think about, oh, I'm going to like, someone's going to look look up to me one day um but what i've noticed is that uh, and i get a lot of people well went back when we were doing meet and greets on on tour remember those um i i get a lot of parents and talking to me about um the fact that i'm very um unapologetic about who i am and what i do and what i believe in and which which is funny because a lot of the things that i do and say and talk about and um are traditionally a parent's nightmare so um but but i think it's just it's the honesty and being comfortable with yourself and i try to tell people that you know look i'm not a doctor i'm not a therapist i'm not you know i'm 
I'm, I'm going to make mistakes. You know, there's going to be my first piece of advice to the world is do not drink and tweet. Uh, <laughs> so far, so good. I haven't really done anything yet, but you know, it's awesome. And it's an honor to, to be that for people. A uh, specific example, there was a, a single dad um, with two girls in a meet and greet once and he gave me this huge hug and, uh, and he just was talking to me about how, um, you know, even with songs like Do Not Disturb or I, or I Get Off, some of the more um, uh, sexual empowerment songs that I do, he told me, he's like, I hope that my little girls um, grow up and are as comfortable with talking about that and, and their own sexuality uh, as, as you are. And like, you've, you've done so much for them, but also for me as a parent, knowing that that's out there. And it's like, it just, it makes my day to know that. But um yeah, so I guess I don't necessarily seek out. I, I'm not, I'm not feeling pressure with it because all I can be is myself. I'm not gonna like put on this facade. Like I'm gonna, you know, I'm I am this now, and I'm this role model, and I have to be perfect. And I, I think, just the more that I am me, um, the just better that is for everybody all around. Well, I think that's what makes a role model. You're not perfect. You're real, and you're you're uh, you show people, yeah, I'm a human just like you. And I think that's also a part of it because there are people who, who try so hard to be perfect and you kind of see that. But with you, it's like I, every moment is a very human moment. And I even just picture you like when you say you've given the guitar pick to the girl in the front row. Like I picture you changing the course of that girl's life and her being the next hit Lizzie Hale in another like 10, 15 years. So I think that's really amazing. And um, I guess really just to, to wrap things up here, um, the big question is, you know, this has been out live in Philly for 10 years now. Do you think there's going to be any other plans? I mean, obviously right now, any plans you might have had probably put on hold. But do you think in the future that we could expect uh, an additional and a second live release from you guys of Hailstorm now? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We're well overdue. Yeah, we, and we, we've recorded <clears throat> all of our shows now for the last like year or two. So we have a ton of <laughs> material and we just got to, I don't know. Work it out. We one just got to do days. it. Yeah. Um, Should it, we? You know, I have the box of oh, live in Philly vinyl here. Then we, we haven't, haven't opened it. We yet. haven't opened it yet. Do, we we haven't we... even seen it. Uh, well, on that note, let's do a little unboxing here of the live in Philly box set. Lizzie and Joe are going to open it up. This is actually their first time unboxing this as well. So there's a lot of surprises for all of us in in store. And let's check out what we got going on here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so impressed with that guitar pick. <laughs> yeah. Multi-purpose. Whoa, Ooh, look, that's it says awesome. Run out groove. That's neat. That's ah, cool. Yeah, that is neat. Look at that. Remember? I remember. Right, here, here's one for you. Thank you. One for me. Let's get this out of here. You gotta crack it that's open. That's awesome. Ta-da! Got mine. Look at that. That is awesome. Wow. It's a lot bigger than the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say, I, I see what you're talking about with the hair. No. <laughs> oh, we've all been there. We have all been there. The uh, early to early 2000s to like 2010 were dark times in fashion of rock and roll. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I, remember, I, I remember seeing like, well, I, I've seen like pictures and I used to like uh, wear a, whole, a lot of homemade stuff because we just, we couldn't afford to have nice clothes or anything. So we would like, we would go into stores that had like, Three hundred dollar pair of pants. We like. I could sew that. I can do that. whatever. So I got very, um, very scissor happy about it, and I started cutting stuff up. But there was a point in time. I think it was in like two thousand ten, two thousand eleven, where I think I was just wearing everything in my wardrobe and had these like goggles for a second, like these steampunk goggles. And like nobody told me that I looked ridiculous. Nobody, not one of you guys. Nobody said a word. <laughs> you just let me go on stage like that. That's the problem with being in a in a group with men. <laughs> they don't they just don't know. <laughs> Ooh, look at that! That's neat. Oh, sick! It's that looks awesome. Oh yeah, I got the smoky one too. We'll have to uh, we'll have to put That's that cool. on the old turntable. See if it actually yeah. plays. I like that. <laughs> I see through. That's neat. That's so cool, man! I remember we started off the whole thing, uh, the whole show a cappella. Yeah. And I had like a hood on, and like. And, and I was starting from off stage, so I couldn't really see the crowd when I started. So I just start singing, and then I don't know. It, that was that was 
that was crazy. That was neat. You're crazy, man. I know. No, it was just fun. It was fun to think about those moments back in the day that getting that that was the trick. That was the thing that we could do that we knew like would at least get some people excited and start the set in a different way. Yeah, yeah. It's you're not getting it back in. Yeah, you're not getting it. it back in. Yeah. Look at the pictures. See, that was neat. Your leather. Look at all the chains you had on. I know. All, all my Slayer. Look, look, look. I, I remember. I so I cut out our logo from a like a leather piece of something, and then I sewed it to the back of the jacket. So yeah, the, all of all of this stuff was homemade. <laughs> That's incredible. That really is. And I mean, you also, Lizzie, have always had such a enviable wardrobe. I mean, you're always wearing the coolest leather, the coolest shoes, the coolest jackets, pants. So to know that some of that was handmade blows my mind right now because you always have been well dressed. I mean, even back in the day, I always admired your style and your wardrobe and was like, damn, she looks cool. So oh, that's awesome. So this is cool. Remember, this is your white explorer before you had oh, a yeah, my model. That was my first explorer. That flying V, I just saw something. That's at a the one with the little tribally things that's mm -hmm. at a hard rock cafe in like Japan. Oh, really? It finally got placed yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Weird. Cool. Neat. Yeah. And that Explorer was my first Explorer. Um, I got that when we were making our first record in California and I uh, got it on Craigslist or whatever, went over to the guy's house. He had to sell it because of his medical bills. He had gotten into a car accident. And so, and so he was really bummed to sell it. But he's like, you know, are, are you actually going to play it, though? And I'm like, yeah, I'm in a rock band. We're, we're making our first record on Atlantic Records. And he's like, oh, good. So it, it'll have a good home. It'll get played. And like, I've just I'm like, yes, it was like I was like adopting like a child. Like, yes, I'm going to give it a good home and it's going to it's going to be great. You know, so I don't know whether he actually ended up looking us up or keeping in touch. Uh, well, have you heard from him? No, I, I'm just, I'm, I yeah. hope that he knows. <laughs> it spawned a signature model or six. Yeah, it did. So that's cool. <laughs> or six. <laughs> six. Wait, uh, one, two. Well, I'm getting there. There's more getting coming. There. There's more coming, yeah. So before we let you guys go, we have a very special surprise for you. We have contacted some of your friends and some of your co-conspirators and <laughs> have some testimonials. So... Let's get to them and see what you guys think. First up is one Mr. Corey Taylor of Slipknot and Stone Sour. My first memory of Hailstorm was actually working with them in 2008. Uh, we got together to do some writing and stuff, uh, which was like the first time I'd ever done anything like that. Even by then, they seemed like old hands at it. They were fine. They were just like... They're like, whatever, dude, you know, I mean, we just hung out. We had a great time, just had fun with it, um, got to be quick friends. And then just over the years, it's just been more and more uh, just, you know, a friendship getting stronger and stronger, you know, Aww. I've done so many tours with them, so many shows with them, actually. And I've seen them work their ass off and really develop an incredible fan base uh an incredible repertoire of music to and and you know the cool thing is to really know their backstory um to see them come from you know the very very bottom you know playing clubs doing you know doing the, the club circuit which is something i totally get to you know to building something real and doing it with the same cats they've been doing it for with for God knows how many years now. Man. Yeah. I mean, that's special. And I mean, they're a special band. They're really great people, great musicians. They work their ass off. They kick ass live. I mean, it's it, it's it's been really rad to see them, uh, you know, get to where they've been. And uh, especially, you know, being friends with Lizzie and RJ, you know, um, they're, they're all, I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you never know in this business and to see them really achieve what they've achieved is, is awesome. You know, yeah. from the, from this, from the time of inventing what we called the uncle butt, which is <laughs> the walk <laughs> to, um, to actually, you know, every time me and RJ see each, each other, we have, you know, it's it's a race to see how creatively we can tell each other to go fuck themselves. <laughs> it's uh, it's the little things like that that create 
a friendship and a relationship that can last a really long time. So it's uh, it's it's one of my you know, they're one of my favorite bands to hang out with and just to be with. And they're great, great friends, great people. Oh, oh thanks, sweet. Corey. What a dude. What a dude. Uncle Butt. I yeah, forgot about Uncle I, Butt. <laughs> so, I can't do it. We probably shouldn't demonstrate that. You no, just That's going to have to be an internal joke. Corey and RJ had the Uncle Butt down. Yeah. Didn't RJ walk out on stage? Uncle he walked Butt out on stage. Yeah. I guess it's like just an old man kind of. Uh, Uncle Butt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with your ass sticking out. I don't know. It, it's hard to describe. But uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like C- Corey is amazing. And uh, when, when we got to know Corey and he came over, he, he mentioned... Um, about us you know writing together and when we got together writing he came in with like four like venti coffees you know and we're like oh what a nice guy he brought us coffees like no they were all for him they were, they were his coffee <laughs> he was very much caffeinated it was such a cool thing and he's such such a great guy um just one of the true golden humans yeah. in this life you know regardless like well, he's, he- obviously he's like amazingly talented and a staple in this business a lifer um but that was really sweet of him to say (laughs) that's awesome nice nice. what a dude well thank you Corey, for those kind words and next we have your friend brent smith from shinedown with a couple of words for you as well what is up everyone brent smith here from the band shinedown you know who i am uh hailstorm i don't even know where to begin uh these individuals are family to us And we love them, Lizzie, Joe, Josh, RJ, really our family. Um, It's just been a joy to watch them grow and continue to watch them grow as not only performers, but musicians and and songwriters. They just mean a lot to a lot of people out there, especially in the rock and roll community, but in music in general. Um, I don't have like one specific story because there's so many of them. Um, But what I can say is that when it comes to influence, that's exactly what they do. Um, you know, uh, affronted by a female, um, a powerful female, um, <laughs> and what they represent and who they are as individuals comes through every single night on stage and on every single record. Uh, but they're beyond influential uh, on a lot of different levels. Like I said, I'm rambling. Um, but yeah, we just love them and look forward to seeing what they got next uh, for years and years to come. Um, oh, but one last thing to RJ, uh, on behalf of myself and Guy Sykes, um, stop eating all the Taco Bell. (laughs) (laughs) That is a story. (laughs) That's awesome. Man, Brent's awesome. Oh, that's great. What a nice guy. Um, (laughs) that was so long ago. So we've been... Shine Down was one of the first bands to take us out um, on a national tour, and um, and so yeah, we literally like we didn't even know like what a rider was, what catering was supposed to be, you know, all of those things. So we were like, they were very good to us because we were very naive about all yeah. of the uh, the tour rules and the way things no are supposed idea. to be. Had no clue, and um, the first like the very first time we ever played with them was at Summerfest in Milwaukee and. 2005 we had just gotten signed yeah. and they're like hey you're gonna open up for shine down at this festival in milwaukee we're like cool you know and uh we were just a bar band at that point playing yeah. local shows around pennsylvania and that mid-atlantic region and uh we went and we played we were on right before them and um we got done and the crowd was like asking for an encore so they were like go ahead do one we don't care <laughs> you know like it's like oh god we're like all right you know if people want something you give it to them and and uh, so we did it. And it, like, who lets the opening band yeah. do an encore? Who, who, who so does funny. that? Yeah. And th- then we learned that that wasn't a normal thing because we did some shows with another band and we were the first of like three bands. And we got done. People were like, one more song. And we're like, all right, let's <laughs> so do it then. And so we just did it and we got we got in trouble. Uh, like, you, they're like, what are you doing? You can't do that. So cringy. <laughs> they're like, well, they asked. They're like, yeah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so like, cringy. Oh. And, and the... the the Taco Bell reference. So yeah, so it was their after show food, yeah. but for Shine Down. Yeah. And RJ just thought it was for everybody, and so he like ate most of it. And then if you've never, if you've never dined with RJ, he we call him Four Plates Hail because he will literally go up to catering and he will fill up four massive plates of food. Right. So 
you know, 10, you know, however many years ago, well, that's, this was not any different. <laughs> and so he like ate all their food and everybody was like mad. And, uh, and like, he's like, what? It, it was just Taco Bell. It was there. It's for everybody, right? Like, no, no <laughs> it wasn't nobody. for you. <laughs> so yeah, they, they, I, I, I commend all of the boys in shine down um for dealing with us during those you know beginning years and uh <laughs> and letting us make those mistakes without you know wanting to murder us <laughs> maybe murder wantage there, but... there might have yeah maybe there might have been a little bit of murder wantage but... <laughs> well deserved <laughs> yes we deserved it <laughs> I'm not going to lie. If RJ ate all of my Taco Bell, I would stab him. So yeah, I do <laughs> admire their restraint. <laughs> you don't come in between a band and their Taco Bell. You no. just don't. You don't do that. The fact that they took us out on like eight more tours after that, I'll yeah. never understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has been enlightening. This has been great learning all these stories, but we're not done yet. Last and certainly not least, we have all of the guys of Theory of a Dead Man and they also have a couple of words that they'd like to share. What's up, guys? So we're at uh, Hailstorm, big 10th anniversary show in Philly. Uh, we got any Hailstorm stories? <laughs> we, don't, we don't get together and, and talk very often, but when we do, it's, it's for our great friends in Hailstorm. Aww. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we've known them since way back in, I don't know the year, but it was when we were recording one of our records. It may have been our third record. Was it 2007? Second record? I think I want to say it was our second record. The first time we went to LA, we went to the Oakwood Apartments, and I remember we were just kind of touring, scoping it out, and we went to the grill section where they had all the grills there, which we actually met a bunch of people there, but we like ran into Hailstorm at Oakwoods, and they were just living there. Yeah. <laughs> they were all living, the whole band and the two parents were living in. Uh, a two bedroom apartment and I think they had a pet rat. They had a rat, yeah. Yeah, they had a rat. Yeah. And they were just well. hanging out, waiting to record Ty, their first debut record. Ty, you and I did a like a Halloween party at their place and we, we were all dressed up in John Deere stuff. You remember that? <laughs> yes, that's right. It's just the two just the two of us uh, in, in LA, I think. But I remember uh, did, man, we didn't Jay ahead, Leno stop by too? He was doing that jaywalking bit that Yeah, he and he knocked on their door. On. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was all the same time. But I mean, one last thing is, if you can find it there, I'm not in it, but the you, Dean and Dave are in it. Uh, oh, you guys did a hilarious. dedicated video, oh. lip syncing video with those guys. At it, was like thin, it was a Thin Lizzy song called Dedication, and uh, we a, just like yeah. set up cameras all around and just drank, and it was a it was a good time. Yeah, you got to search it. I think search Dedication Hailstorm. Yeah, I, theory. Yeah, I don't know. You'll find it. You'll see how much fun we had with those guys. Yeah, we had like, we miss those guys set up all around the apartment, didn't we? And just blared the song and ran around. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that was, was amazing. <laughs> wow, well, we miss those guys, and we'll see them soon. And uh, congrats for 10-year anniversary. Enjoy Ten the years. show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Sweet. How sweet. <laughs> and then they, you can tell they couldn't figure out how to turn it uh, um, Oh, awesome. my gosh. Yeah, that's uh, – yeah, there's far too many. We were grilling out with those guys. We would drink with them. Um, and yeah, you can absolutely Watch, curb your enthusiasm and God, we had fun. God, we had so much fun. Yeah. And definitely like, yeah, cause we were just Remember there we doing somersaults down the hill. Yeah. That wasn't smart. No, that was, that could have been bad. Yeah. We yeah. survived. It, rem did, did we take them around and with the stink bombs? I don't were know. they involved? I don't know. With I, that? I think they, they might were have been. smarter than that. I think they were smarter than that. <laughs> yeah, we got in a lot of trouble at the Oakwoods Apartments in Burbank, and uh, but yeah, we were we were kind of in purgatory when we were making our first record because we went out there just to spend you know like really I think it was like two weeks and do some writing and like meet some producers and all of that, and then. Um, one thing led to another. There were a lot of things that happened. You know, our A&R guy got fired and we were just kind of stuck and not really knowing. Um, and the guy that was going to produce our record ended up backing out of that. And so we were like looking for other people and we were just constantly just writing. We ended up with like 60 songs and we lived through a, a mudslide, a fire. Um, there was an er There were two earthquakes. Yeah, we were out there 19 months. Yeah, we were like, out there 19 months. We were months. supposed to be out there two weeks, and we ended up out there <laughs> yeah, was, 19 months. But we incredible. came out of it with the first record. We came out of it with totally the record. Totally worth it. But but it was so refreshing to like 
find out that our neighbors for a little bit were the theory guys and um and we just had far too much fun with those guys yeah, yeah it was so, awesome yeah definitely look it up on youtube dedication with fear it's of a dead man ridiculousness it's, it's just stupid it yeah. would you know but it's great <laughs> Wow. Well, that's awesome. This has been so rad getting to hang with you guys, talking about the past, the present, the future, uh, hearing from your friends. Is there anything else that you guys have coming up that maybe you want to promote or uh, that we maybe didn't get a chance to talk about? Yeah, we got a big tour coming. No, just kidding. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, man. Way to end this on a down note. <laughs> No, I mean we're we're writing for another record, so um, yeah. On the other side of this, we'll we'll have a lot of new material for everyone to that we're uh, right now. We're really super excited about it, so it's I think we've exceeded our expectations. That's been the one um, silver lining of just having, you know, ha having to just kind of step it up, you know, on your own and just with uh, with the world going on crazy on around us, but. Really, the, like the thing that I'd love to say is just thank you so much to not only to you guys for for doing this interview, but to all of the fans that have been like sticking it out with us for the last ten years, and um, and everybody that was there, everybody that helped us get to this point, um, all of our amazing friends, uh, you know that, and bands that let us open up for them, and and uh, all the advice that we've gotten over the years uh, from everybody and. Uh, it's just been incredible. It's been an incredible journey. Um, uh, what what an amazing lifetime to have lived and uh, doing it with your best friends. Yeah, you know. So it's, what it's a, all about. Yeah, it's it it's a uh, that's do what that's you life. Love with the people you love, and that's you know we're lucky to be able to do that. Party on! What a decade. <laughs> all right. Well, Lizzie, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been awesome. Everyone out there watching, remember Hailstorm live in Philly. It's first ever released on vinyl. You can pre-order it now. The link will be in the description at YouTube. Yeah. This is too much fun. I get off on you. Getting off on me. Give you what you want. With nothing is the best. Left